All right. Sorry, I needed to take a deep breath. Yeah. Okay. Hello, and welcome to everybody to meet our friends. Today, we're going to talk to Terry Haas. Um, she is just a fantastic member of our carnivore com community. Um, she's sharing just wonderful recipes um, on her YouTube channel. Um, she's very active on Instagram, and we're just so excited to hear about all the things with her today. So we're going to start out, Terry, um, by asking you to just share um, what has brought you to carnivore, what your journey's been like, maybe um, physical and mental um, improvements that you've seen, um, and just whatever else you'd like to throw in. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me, ladies. I really appreciate you and um, your interest in me and letting me share my um, my mission and my niche in this community. Um, I, I guess kind of my story starts out when I was a young child. And I know I, I know a lot of you will probably be, be able to relate. Um, I was one of those children that never liked vegetables. So I think my carnivore journey <laughs> started there, you know, not really in earnest because obviously, um, you know, I was born in 1966. So we still had, you know, packaged foods and all that kind of stuff. But the way that um, my mom cooked growing up was like the roasts and the potatoes. Um, I don't really remember having bread at every meal until later on, you know. Um, but so that kind of started there. I was I never liked any vegetables and I have one of those um, childhood stories where you're not leaving the table until you finish your sweet potatoes. And um, I remember it being dark, <laughs> still sitting at that table. And I don't, I, I'm, I'm assuming I probably had to bend to the rules and eat my sweet potatoes. And they just tasted, they didn't taste like food. That's all I can say is they just didn't taste like food. So I just remember early on thinking, how can this be something I should be eating if it tastes so terrible? I'm also fortunate that my mom wasn't like a big vegetable pusher or anything like that. We didn't have weird vegetables. Um, but I do remember coming home from college and um, again, always being a very heavy beef eater, a very heavy fat eater. Like I was, you know, Jack Spratt's wife, always dig diving in for the big globs of fat first. Um, and nobody else liked it. So I felt really lucky, you know, I'm like, Ooh. Um, and when I came home from college, my mom had this bowl of tomatoes and olive oil and possibly basil. I mean, that would have been my first introduction to basil. So it could have been there. I don't really recall. And I remember coming in, I was so excited, you know, mom's cooking home from college for the weekend. And she has this bowl of, you know, rabbit food sitting on the table on the counter. And I said, well, that mom and she says oh I'm trying out a new dish we're going to try to eat <laughs> you know more fruits and vegetables and you know move away and I was like oh okay and I said well is there also like a meat dish to go with this and she goes yes there's something just in case you know in case this didn't work out and you know, I had a little serving and I'm like okay well where's the roast beef you know um <clears throat> and then fast forward to I ate I'm going to say standard American diet. I mean, who doesn't when you're, you know, in the 80s, 90s, whatever. And um, I had kids. Uh, they ate those disgusting fast food kids cuisine meals because that was easy. And you think you're doing chicken nuggets and the vegetables. Um, I moved us over to pasta. We had, you know, spaghetti once a week and chicken breast and all that kind of stuff. I will say when I would make chickens, uh, a chicken or whatever, um, I would eat the skin first um, before I would put it on the table because nobody liked the skin. Um, and I would kind of eat off the drumsticks, although I would save those because the kids really like that. Um, but um, fast forward I, to, I guess, about 20, well, actually, you know what? I'll say in 1992 is really when I was a little bit more vindicated with my fat, um, eating fat. So um, I was one of those ones that said, you know what? I don't like fruits. I don't like vegetables. I don't really like grains. They make me feel terrible. And I didn't quite understand why. And of course you want to fit in. You're like, everybody's moving in this direction. Right. And, um, I just thought at one point I thought I like beef. I like dairy. I like fat. So I'm going to either die at 50 of a heart attack 
um, because I'm not going to fit in and I'm not going to eat this food that doesn't taste like food to me. I'm going to, you know, waste away. 1992 was an Oprah show. And the name of that show was The French Paradox. And I stay at home mom, watched Oprah every day. And um, I remember watching it when they had these thin French ladies on and they talked about how they ended their meal with brie or they had heavy whipping cream and they had their full fats. And it just took a few bites for them to feel satiated. This was also me coming off of Weight Watchers, because I was a little bit heavy after the birth of my second child, I had two kids really back to back, whatever, and I was trying the salads and I was trying the chicken breast and I lost a little bit of weight, but I felt terrible. I felt less than I didn't feel nourished. And so I saw this show and literally that show, I think, I don't know if it saved my life, but that show did. It vindicated me. I said, you know what? I'm going to be like the French then. I'm going to be a fat French person, (laughs) but I'm going to be like the French, you know, because I'm going to enjoy my fat stuff. And I literally threw everything fat free, everything low fat out the window that day. And I still ate stuff from the standard American diet. We had a candy drawer. My dad grew up with a candy drawer. I grew up with a candy drawer. 99 cents for 10, you know, little mini Snickers. And I would go every week and I would buy 10 packages of those, you know. And um, so, um, and I still ate those, but I dropped a lot of the other stuff because when you eat fat, you're sated, right? And sure enough, within a few months, the weight kind of pretty much fell off. I wasn't like slim and trim, but I was pretty happy with my weight. And I started exercising and then I got pregnant again. And during that pregnancy, it was really interesting because I didn't crave any meat. I didn't crave any fat. I craved salads. (laughs) I couldn't even watch a Taco Bell commercial because it made me nauseous. And of course, then I was like, wow, maybe I've gotten all this wrong, you know? And then when she was born, that lasted till about 15, she was 15 months old. And then I dove right back in and I actually lost weight during that pregnancy. I lost about 12 pounds. So I still had some weight to lose, obviously, from the other two babies and that sort of thing. Um, Then fast forward to 2015. And that's when I joined this uh, migraine group. I'd had migraines started with the birth of my third child, my daughter. And that group was focused on low carb, high fat. And about a year or so into that group, that's when I started hearing things about the carnivore way of eating. And what I thought was really interesting is when I joined that group, we were still eating potatoes because they were kind of low glycemic at the time. And we were still eating sprouted like Ezekiel bread. Um, And I noticed reducing my carbohydrates at that time that I was feeling pretty crummy eating those foods. Like I could tell that they weren't making me feel my best, but I love my potatoes. I love my French fries. I love my chips, right? Who doesn't? And even though, and even then in 2016 ish, we weren't really quite aware of seed oils. So um, I didn't even think that that was on my radar. Shortly thereafter, um, this group moved and started a, a keto group as well. And when I moved to keto, that's when I dropped everything because once you kind of move into ketosis, I was already in a low level of ketosis at the time. Um, didn't have the greatest blood sugars or whatever, but um, when I moved over to there, I really dropped almost all plant foods. So my ketogenic diet at the time really was more a carnivore diet because I looked at my carbohydrates from my dairy and from like oysters or liver or um, you know other things that are like, I also include eggs and mushrooms in my uh, carnivore diet. So those things have carbohydrates. So I thought, well, I'm meeting my ketogenic level carbohydrates, right? A few months later, all of a sudden, then the carnivore way of eating really came on the scene. And I thought, I'm already there. Um, So, you know, um, that's basically my segue into it. I didn't really know that I was doing that. I thought it was a ketogenic diet. Every once in a while, I'd have some avocado or some tomatoes, but Again, removing the plant foods as much as I had really makes you understand how those plant foods interact with your body when you don't keep them in on a regular basis. So especially tomatoes, I thought I'd really liked tomatoes. And then after I was like, the skin is 
horrible. I can't stand tomato skin now. Um, so essentially that's how I segued into my carnivore diet. So a little bit not conventional the way that typical people do. Um, but now I'm here and I love it and I'm never going back. <laughs> that is awesome. That's, I, I can relate to so much of that. Um, even the, the, the keto part of it, when I was, when I thought I was keto, but <laughs> <laughs> I could never meet like the fat. I could keep the carbs down, but I couldn't yeah. the fat threshold and still, because I was restricting calories at the same time, which, okay. Because I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. Right. Um, but yeah, it was mostly meat. I was like, I just want the meat. Like, do I have to eat these vegetables? And <laughs> then realize that there's such a thing as carnivore. I thought, holy mm -hmm. cow. I, I didn't even know that that's, that was a thing that you could do. Like, <laughs> right. Like, it is scary. Have. It's scary yeah. too. I mean, knowing, you know, even though you kind of know, it's still very scary because, you know, vegetables are pushed everywhere. <laughs> right. Right. Like, oh, you've got to eat the rainbow and whatever. Like that's so ingrained in us. Um, and the fact that you kind of inherently always went for the meat and the fat anyway. So you were born a carnivore. I mean, we all are, but you, you kind of, somewhere right. put, you, you, you didn't fight it so much. I didn't because, well, and I also probably should add into the mix. So I, I have a migraine, I have migraine genetics. My dad had migraine. My grandmother's had migraine as far as I know. And even though you have migraine genetics, that doesn't necessarily mean that those genes will express. This is the same for all genetics, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily follow like 23 and me unless these things express, then you can explore that. Um, and Migraine, migraineurs are glucose intolerant by genetics. That is like the, the, the root issue. This is Angela Stanton's research in the migraine group. This is not my research. This is her research. So um, when you read that, you know, at, in 2015, after I'd already kind of been through all this kind of stuff and was settling into way more meat heavy and way more fat heavy. And I also was one that naturally fasted or naturally practiced timed restricted eating. I was just not hungry in the mornings. Um, and it kind of makes sense to me now too, because I was carb loading the day before. And what I've also found out naturally, just naturally moving to low carb, high fat, and then the ketogenic diet very shortly. And then carnivore is, um, if I do a very carb heavy day, because I do segue, I should say plant heavy. I do segue since I do have metabolic flexibility now, um, insulin sensitivity, I can, I segue like in the summer I eat, I move away from carnivore, even though that is 95% or 98% of the way I eat all of the time in the summer, I love cherries. So I will buy cherries. I can eat about nine cherries in a sitting. And then I start to feel the blood sugar and the hypoglycemia. And it's like, ah, so I stop there. Nine cherries say, you know, makes me feel comfortable. I feel delighted to eat nine cherries. I don't necessarily eat nine cherries a day. Maybe one day it's 10, a couple, every couple of days. I also love watermelon. So I'll have some of that in the summer too. Not on the same day, not in the same week. Again, you can do that if you want, but for me, I don't feel great doing that, but I still want to enjoy these foods, right? So um, I just lost my train of thought. So um, where was I going with that? So I will kind of eat off carnivore. Is that where I was going with that? <laughs> Might have to edit this part. <laughs> I think you, so you were talking kind of like seasonally and that kind of leads us into the next question of what does your day-to-day -day eating look like um okay like right now kind of at the end of winter and what will it look like in a couple of months so in in winter time is when i'm really carnivore <laughs> i mean really really carnivore um there's just I have really eliminated so many plant foods from my diet just over time. Like I did enjoy avocado. I would sometimes eat that in the winter or seasonally, whatever. And now I find I buy an avocado because I want it right then, or I wanted it the day before. And then it sits there and it goes to waste. I can tell you right now, 
three weeks ago, I bought some raspberries. I bought some blueberries, which I typically don't eat, but I was also wanting to try this new recipe. Um, and I don't really like to introduce recipes that I don't really want to include in my own diet and blueberries aren't the greatest, but you know, people eat blueberries. So anyway, so, um, I have not eaten one raspberry. I had, um, about five blueberries the other day and they were kind of mushy and not really sweet. So I thought I'm not even going to eat those either. Cause it's not, you know, not worth it to me. Um, so in the winter time, really, I'm very, I'm, I'm, strict carnivore, but my carnivore, you know, isn't like lion diet or anything. So I do find in the winter that I move more towards that. Cherries do start to come out in January, I find in Costco. So um, I did buy cherries um, and I didn't even enjoy nine cherries a day. And I ended up throwing out over half the cherries. <laughs> um, so you know, I'm finding the less that I eat plant foods, the less that they appeal to me. And then when you go do eat a cherry or a piece of watermelon, it burns my mouth because the sugar is, you know, it's just entirely the glucose is so sweet in it. So it's less and less. Um, even with onions and garlic, those are kind of ones that I've kind of kept along too because they're so delicious. I remember last summer I went through a kick where I was really in the mood for onions. And so I was making a bunch of cheeseburgers with grilled onions on there. And then one day I woke up and I think I had two onions left. I promise, I think one of them is still sitting on my counter because I'm like, oh, one day I'm going to make onion rings. Well, they just don't sound palatable, you know? So um, it's just weird. And I would have never thought that I would get here because you just think that you're going to enjoy these flavors. Now what I've found, honestly, um, I've moved to spices because I do use spices and I always have used spices, but even my spice use is getting less, less and less and less. So I don't know if that's the case with everybody. I've been at this now almost eight years and I would have never imagined that it would have been, become more narrow, but yet more enjoyable. I'm shocked, to be honest. <laughs> I love it. But <laughs> you, that whole segment right there so describes how, like the seasons I feel like I go through with it, you know, of, um, you know, adding and taking things away and then also feeling like my body just wants certain things at certain times. And, and the same thing with like avocados and tomatoes, you know, yesterday I wanted an avocado. So then the next day I go to the grocery store and I buy a whole truckload of them and then I don't eat them, you know? And I just yes. kind of do those things over and over. And sometimes I do get them home and I want it five days in a row. It's so, it's just yes. so bizarre, you know? But um, I wanted to ask you, um, do you identify with being food addicted? And also, um, I know that you, you, you incorporate a lot of dairy and can you just kind of talk about that along with that? Because people, there are so many people who are food addicted that dairy is an issue for them. Right. I am fortunate in that I am not food addicted. I'm not addicted to anything other than, you know, a ribeye, a ribeye calf steak. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm fortunate that way. So I know I've seen the abstainer and moderator terms, um, you know, floating around. Those are also new terms for me. So what's really interesting is like the, the arena that I've been in with the migraine group, it's been kind of a closed arena. So we have people that have been chronic you know, migraineurs, chronic pain sufferers and whatnot. So, um, and then segueing over to Instagram almost a year ago, it's just, it was the biggest shock to me because, you know, I'm under, um, Angela's my mentor. She's a PhD. She's a researching PhD. She doesn't care about anything other than the truth. She's not out to make money or anything. And then you go over to other Instagram. I'm just going to say Instagram because I'm not on TikTok or anything. Um, and it, the misinformation and the, just the, um, it's just, it's a little, it was very shocking to me. That's all I can say. It's shocking to me and just seeing all the trial and error and that sort of thing. So anyway, and that's where I'd first heard this abstainer and moderator thing, uh, terms. Um, so 
and it's kind of slowly crept in over there as well in, in Angela's group. So I'm an admin over there. So I help I help people learn to be learn her protocol, learn to be migraine free, learn how to start a low carb, high fat diet, learn how to start a carnivore diet. Um, and she has two groups, and there's two different um, ways to do this. So um, some people have started coming in that are addicted to dairy, and so this is a new avenue for me to learn as a coach and an administrator or a teacher versus just coming at it from my own personal experience. So um, I have no problem. I do love dairy. There are days that, um, not going to lie, that I have subsisted on milk. Um, those are also days like I'm, I'm, um, I've had some health issues. Um, I'm, they're almost resolved. I think they have come down to a medication that I've been on for 20 years. Um, so there were days like I've had gastritis. I have had times where I've gone through um, just stressors and I'm a non-eater when I get stressed. Um, I'm a non-eater when um, things get too much to me. I just like, that's just my personality. So on days where I know I need to eat because my weight is low and I know I need the calories, even though we don't look at SECO, but stress makes you run through everything so quickly. So there have been days I've relied on milk, you know, five, six cups of milk over the day. I've, you know, you've commented before, you've seen me drink my quart of half and half with my meal. Um, and that's mostly to kind of help me with fat and whatnot, because I do need a little bit higher fat macros at this stage in the game. Um, as far as dairy, what I've seen in my experience with members in the group, there's also a spectrum of people that need to, um, that can moderate to a degree, but yet still need to abstain from certain types of dairy. Milk seems to be one that can be either way. Some people can be fine with milk. Some people are not fine with milk. For others, the majority really seems to be cheese. Um, I have never heard of somebody that can just start eating cheese and never stop. That was not something that was my experience because for me, I can eat some cheese and then I'm full and I can't eat any more cheese. Same with like steak. Like I will eat steak. I will eat my meal until I can't take another bite to where it makes me feel physically like, oh, I can't. I don't eat cheese like that because I don't really snack or anything, but like my last bite of, bite of my meal will always be meat. It won't be the cheese, mm -hmm. but there's people that can take a bite of cheese and they'll go through a block of cheese. And um, so some of them also have a more sensitivity to whey versus casein. So that, that also comes into play there. Um, and this is something I'm also learning through these members of how to have the, um, you know, good language, proper language to help them not have triggers. Um, so these are all things that I'm learning, learning to navigate as an admin in that group, as well as a health coach, um, because these are new things for me. So um, interestingly, also, um, Migraineurs are very different than non-migraineurs. We have an ancient brain. So we were the ones, we're very hypersensitive. We have more neuronal connections. We have um, more neurotransmitters. So we are affected by stimuli much more than a non-migraineur. We are also the ones that were like staying awake at night with the full moon, making sure our tribe were not, you know, attacked by predators. We're also the ones um, that were testing foods to see if you, we, you know, tribes would die from foods. We, we have an, a, a greater sense of hearing, a greater sense of smell, a greater sense of peripheral vision as well. So um, that being said, this all ties kind of into that we are also more able to um, handle dairy than non-migrainers. So I don't know if that was an evolutionary thing that happened, you know, after our, our genetics or whatever, to where it seems like non-migrainers are not able to handle dairy as much as we are. Um, it's a very big part of Angela's protocol, and we really encourage those that are able to drink or, you know, include dairy to include it because it is such a, you know, a, a tasty addition to a carnivore way of eating. So in a roundabout way, um, hopefully that answered something and if not more <laughs> um, in there with that. 
Thank you. I appreciate that because, um, you know, I, I started with migraines when I was 12 and I, oh. I was the biggest milk drinker. Like I never ate anything without having a glass of milk with it. And everybody always yes. thought it was so weird. <laughs> and, you know, I, I didn't ever feel like I had an addiction to it even with cheese I I never want more and more and more cheese but mm -hmm. um I just feel like I need some half and half or or something every single day to yep. feel good and mm -hmm. and I as a carnivore you know hearing about people saying you know they can't tolerate dairy or can't moderate it I'm always like I feel like I'm doing something wrong that I shouldn't be having it, you know? So I, when I started seeing you with your half and half and I was like, Oh, this I'm so vindicated right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's funny is I feel really sad for people that can't and don't include dairy. Like I'm, I'm kind of like, are you sure you can't include dairy? Like, are you sure just not a little bit of dairy? Cause like, Dairy makes me so happy and I'm the same. And I mean, I don't feel addicted either, but I'm very much the same. And I don't know. I mean, so for instance, like milk, part of the, the migraine protocol has to deal with electrolyte and milk is very potassium heavy, even though there's sodium in it. Now, cheese is sodium heavy. So maybe there's just something in your body that's trying to self-correct with adding more potassium or adding more sodium naturally. Now that you've already removed most of the plant foods, most of the carbohydrates that are the electrolyte disruptors and the glucose disruptors for us, um, maybe that is just your body's literally literal innate sense of saying, let's keep this balance together. So smart of you to listen to your body. <laughs> that's so cool. I love that. <laughs> it's nice to hear a different perspective because we we hear so much of like you know so many carnivores are you know can't do dairy like you were saying and and just avoid it but also when you said that when you're stressed you don't feel the need to eat so like so many carnivores I feel like uh, use food as a coping mechanism where you kind of are the opposite. So thank you for sharing that because like we hear the opposite end of it so much. Like yeah. somebody needs to hear that they're okay if stress affects them the same way that it affects you. So thank you for, for yeah, saying that. There's, there's that. some of us out, some of us, there are some of us out there and, and it's, you know, I have been overweight and I have been underweight and I'm currently underweight due to this situation, but I tell you what, I mean, I'm feeling so good in the last three days and I am looking forward to gorging and putting on weight. <laughs> um, I even actually thought about like real, I really thought about re returning to like major plant foods just to put on weight so that I could then fast and then really reset my gut, you know, cause your stomach um, cells kind of replace like every two to three days, which is also confusing with this gastritis that I've got going on because I, it should be replacing, but it was due to this medication that I took every day on an empty stomach for the last 20 years. So I'm so looking forward to gorging on food. And when I say gorging, like I'm really like gorging for me, it's going to be like, I have five things that I've been wanting to, to, to video over the last two days, but I've had a really hard two days trying to kind of figure this out. And um, so yesterday was doing nothing but sitting on the couch. And then finally about seven o'clock last night, I literally did nothing. And I, I sat up and I was like, I feel good. So I went and, you know, vacuum sealed my meat, cut up my cheese. I had all these things were kind of, you know, needing to be, you know, vacuum sealed and put in the freezer. So, um, and then today I'm like, okay, now I'm going to get to my five recipes. And there's three of them that I just can't wait to get to because <laughs> they're totally like cheese and high fat, you know? So can't wait excited. to check that out. Now, you said you've been doing this for like this way of eating for like eight years, almost eight years. Yes. Okay. So we're, and you have kids, right? I have, yeah, they're all grown. I'm a grandma. Also I have a two-year-old granddaughter. Oh, nice. No, were they still in the house whenever you started this way of eating and how did, no, my youngest is 28. 
20, no, 29. So they were out of the house. Um, you know, I also cooked like my mom. So the majority, I mean, we sat down for dinner. I cooked dinner every night, but again, it was somewhat sad or whatever. Um, mostly sad in the candy drawer. Um, I know. So it was 2015 for me that I started moving to low carb, high fat. And then within the next year or so is when I segued over to my keto, which was mostly carnivore. And I'll also go ahead and say, so again, I feel very fortunate with the way that I came into the low, low carb, this, you know, alternative eating field, because it was through Angela's group. Um, when I first started there, the, the protocol was not what it is today whatsoever. Um, and I was so fascinated by this and, and I've always been fascinated by the medical field. In fact, it was something that I wanted to get into when I was younger, but, and this kind of ties in, I have a condition called hyperhidrosis. Um, it is a form of dysautonomia and it is excessive sweating. Um, it was, it's an inherited genetic thing. And where I have it is, is excessive sweating on my hands and on my feet, a little bit in my armpits and a little bit in my groin. And so it affected me from the time that I was, that I can remember. And I remember taking tests on scantrons in school and I'm left-handed and like the, the scantrons would rip and tear because I had, you know, sweat dripping off of my hands. Not everybody has it to that, to that degree. Some people have it so much that they sweat on their head. And it's so it can be, it's it's, it's an embarrassing condition. It, it is. As I've gotten older, I realize a lot of people have it. Even people have clammy hands and that's very natural and normal. But at around 12 years old, I realized you can't have drippy, sweaty hands if you're going to be a doctor, <laughs> you know? Um, even if you're going to be a physician or, or even in, you know, a, um, a surgeon, you still have to like shake people's hands. And so that shied me away from that. But I've always been fascinated in a real quick study for medicine. So when I joined Angela's group, wheat belly was out. The big fat surprise was out. You know, cholesterol code was out. I was out reading all of these books, just drowning in them and just absorbing all of them. So I was a really quick study. Her protocol, um, since it is a group of chronic migraine sufferers and chronic pain sufferers, she has designed that group and her carnivore way of eating to literally include everything possible in there instead of eliminating everything. So her thing was not to go right to meat, salt, and water because we're already suffering. We wanted to have joy in our life and, and joy in our food, right? So it's very broad and and all meats, all seafood, all seaweed, um, eggs, mushrooms, and dairy. But the exclusion of fermented dairy and lactose-free dairy. And the reasons for that is, is fermented dairy and lactose-free dairy has the lactose removed. And when, la and when you have lactose-free products and when you have the lactose removed, the second that it hits your saliva, the enzymes have your body realize that that is glucose hitting your body. So these things affect insulin. These thing, things affect blood sugar. Um, so those things are not included in my carnivore way of eating in the, that protocol or any of my clients that work with me. Obviously, I'm not the food police. If you want to still include those, you, you certainly can, but just know that this is what happens when it hits your body. So it can work against you. It can affect your insulin. And even though we're trying to heal migraine over there, and, and, and that's what I am with a majority of my clients, I do have many that are not migraineurs, it still affects their blood sugar as well. Um, they measure ketone, blood ketones, they measure blood sugar, and I have them just kind of do a random spot test to say, okay, fast for, you know, no sugar or no food for 10 hours, whatever, and let's kind of, kind of do a spot test. And all of them are very surprised that yes, it takes them hypo. So um, we include, and we include spices. I include spices too. So all the spices, even things such as like dried chives, even though those are kind of big, my recommendation, because of my personal experience, I can't even handle that dried chive. I have to use a mortar and pestle and grind it up. And now I'm kind of even past that or use just very, very little. So it's a very broad carnivore um, inclusive diet. 
not so typical that you see out outside in the general carnivore community. So people really freak out <laughs> when I tell them what my carnivore eating looks like. But my my justification is like, might as well make it as broad as possible. So you make it as reachable as possible, as enjoyable as possible, as sustainable as possible. And in a few months, if you aren't feeling your best, because you know you have a, a, a honeymoon period on the carnivore diet, it's not like you're going to feel great in a week. You're not. And if you do, you're very lucky. Usually around 90 days, if you've had some, you know, some issues starting around 90 days, the honeymoon period starts. And then I say after that time, if it's been a month or a few weeks and you're still feeling pretty poorly, then let's look at some things to remove. And like the first thing I'm going to tell you to remove is egg whites. If you're including eggs, that's the first thing, because those are typically not, you know, those are typically the ones that are to blame. After that, then I might say, well, then maybe let's take a look at milk. You know, I'm going to really be very, very minute in what we remove because I'm still going to think you have time to heal. You know, people can take years to heal eating this way. It's not a temporary diet. Um, to me, it's the ultimate evolutionary elimination healing way of eating. Absolutely. That that leads really well to our last question, I think, which is, um, well, you could answer it in two ways. First of all, if you could go back and tell yourself something when you were young, um, what would it be as far as this way of eating? Or what would you tell someone who is brand new to this way of eating that might that might help them? Well, the, the first one is extremely easy. <laughs> that couldn't be any easier. Go ahead and never eat the vegetables. Don't waste the money, the time and energy buying the 50 things you ate that you thought you were going to have a smoothie every single day, <laughs> you know, um, for sure. And just really go ahead and eat the things that you really want to eat because it would have been the beef and the, the meats and those sort of things and, and um, that. And then for somebody that's starting out, really, I really want to say like, eat all of the meats, really enjoy every single meat. Because if you don't enjoy beef to start out with, that's not going to be a problem. Enjoy your chicken, enjoy your fish, enjoy all the meats, because at some point you will be narrowing them down and you will get to a base meat. And for the most part, I see beef being number one, lamb, a pretty close second, and you will get to a point where you will never really want to eat any of those other meats. And I have a little bit of sad for that. I honestly do. I can't remember the last time I ate chicken. I have some chicken in my freezer. I didn't even know I had it. Um, and I want to want fried chicken, but not enough to actually eat it. And then I guess this, the second one would be like, give it 90 days. I, I've seen 30 days out there. In my experience, I don't think 30 days is long enough because you still have some gut microbiome changes that are happening. You're still going to probably have some, you know, plant cravings that are going to happen. Um, and if you then decide to indulge in that, and I never call it cheating because this is a way of life. If you ever decide to eat off plan, which I still don't think is a very positive way to look at it, but if you still decide to indulge in something that is non-carnivore, you're going to set yourself back. You're going to kind of set that insulin again, the cephalic response and all that kind of thing. The things that you're trying to settle down um, can be ignited again. So try to set yourself up the best that you can and give it 90 days. If you have a craving for something, for sugar or something during that 90 days, my recommendation is always to eat a meal, to satiety when you're hungry, try not to snack. But if you do have this craving and they happen and it's okay, we will still always love you. <laughs> Guzzle some heavy whipping cream. If you don't do dairy, eat some beef fat, eat some something very high in animal fat. Do it every time you have the craving. And that will not only help your blood sugar, help your insulin settle down, it'll also squash that craving. 
Um, it may not work the first time, but eventually it will work. So those are really key without any other external noise. Those are key, I think, for any sort of somebody that's that's just beginning. Oh, that's so good. Yes, that is great advice. And, and you. again, your perspective is so different than, than what we typically hear. So we really appreciate you Thank coming you. and sharing that with us. Thank um, you. That, that's, that's great because like I said, there's always somebody out there who might be thinking like, it, it, like I never hear this, like, is this not for me? So mm -hmm. having you share that really hopefully lets them know that they are still in the right place, that there, there's right. different ways to come at all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody has unique experiences with it too. So, mm -hmm. and this thank all, you thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. And, and the, the way that this is actually all like come up like full circle for me is so when the pandemic started um, a couple of years ago, that was, you know, truffles were kind of the big thing. I, I go on and off eggs, which is kind of why I said the first thing I would have somebody remove would be egg whites, right? Because they don't sit well with me often. I really don't eat egg whites unless they're mixed in with something. So I remember sitting down one day and I, you know, like, okay, what are you going to eat? And I was in the mood for a sandwich. Like I love a Cuban sandwich. Um, and I'd been making them on chaffles. Um, but chaffles, I was off eggs. And when you're off eggs, a chaffle just literally tastes like a giant egg white piece of something, mm -hmm. you know? And so I remember it was two days. It was two days of like, I just want this sandwich, but I just don't want that dadgum chaffle. So I'm, I'm single. I live alone. Nobody's in my bubble. The world is shut down. What else do I have to do with my time? So I get out Google. I'm going to find a bread recipe if it is the last thing that I do. So I'm Googling and I'm clicking on this link. I'm clicking on this link. I am, you know how it is, clicking on this link. Maybe you don't. I finally do it. I was like, this was the most major rabbit hole I think I've ever been on on Google ever. And I was, you know, sharing, writing these links down. So in case I could go back and refer. Well, all of a sudden I came across this something called uh, uh, soul bread. And it's a woman by the name, she goes by Soul Song now. Her name before was Gloria Koch. And I know that there was another woman involved with this development as well. And I, I don't remember her name because Soul Song is the big one that's attached to it. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. I'm probably gonna take a few minutes to like gather my thoughts because I still get just as excited as I did that day. I'm not joking. I was in my kitchen standing there and I had the phone in my hand, just, you know, whatever I was doing. And, and I looked at my phone and I did this and I threw my phone. I'm not joking. I threw my phone. Like this can't be serious. Went and grabbed my phone, hoping, you know, I didn't lose the website page. Right. This was it. Her recipe is a low carb bread, but it had olive oil and stevia in it. And I looked at it and I said, and I went to Google for real. And I said, can you substitute butter for olive oil in a recipe? Duh. That's how ingrained we are. Yeah. Olive oil has been subbed for butter since time began, right? So of course you can substitute, but I did not know. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just make this bread with butter and omit the stevia because I don't use sweeteners. Wow. <laughs> I can say so. I then now have this bread that I call modified soul bread. So I give all the credit to her because all I did was sub those two ingredients out. Um, that bread has, it's made with whey protein powder. It's very heavily dairy based. So it's made with whey protein powder, the original recipe, and then cream cheese, um, all that butter, and then some non-traditional, um, but I still count them because there I'm healthy and I haven't had any ill effects from using a few non-traditional carnivore ingredients like um, cream of tartar. Since then, the recipe has been morphed. Like I have um, omitted some of the ingredients and moved to more like beef gelatin and is, is in there and trying mm -hmm. to really get it to the most carnivore that I can. Um, I shared that in the migraine group. Um, and since then, 
this group of 13,000 people have morphed that recipe into now we can use ricotta cheese instead of cream cheese. Now you can also use something called milk protein powder, which is a combination of 80% casein protein powder and 20% whey protein powder. So the whey protein powder and cream cheese gives it a very much like a pound cake consistency. So a little bit different consistency. The milk protein powder and ricotta cheese um, gives it more a lighter, airier texture. It sinks a little bit because the case, casein powder is very absorbent, but not a whole lot. Like it doesn't cave in. It just doesn't rise as much as the uh, whey protein powder. So with that bread recipe, I went into that with child mind. I knew nothing and I had this instant amazing success. So I, of course, am now a baker and I know everything, right? Because I had this instant <laughs> success and the universe was with me because the next like 10 things I made and these were all things that I just kind of thought up by myself turned out. Like they just turned out. Now, somebody on a standard American diet may not feel the same way, but somebody that is, you know, added sweetener, added grain, and any of those, all those things free, this was amazing. Like the second thing that I came up with something that I call Terry Taffy. Um, it was called originally something else, but th the group renamed it Terry Taffy. And it's whey protein powder mixed with some heavy whipping cream and like vanilla powder, and just a little bit to where it comes out to like this taffy caramel consistency. So anyway, long story short, what initially started out with this bread recipe that we could eat as migraineurs, because who doesn't miss bread? I'm not going to lie. I miss bread. This would be something that we could eat and help us heal, help the new, new people coming in to segue more into eating more meat. Plus this bread has the whey protein powder in it, which has amino acids, which is a complete protein, which allows you to meet your leucine threshold, which allows you to reach protein synthesis, which allows your body to heal at the cellular level, because that's what's happening when we remove plant foods from our diet. So um, when it started out as the small thing for just the migraineurs has now morphed into what I am have Terry's carnivore treats and my entire mission now it's my it's its own entity it's its own my own baby now where my mission is to make carnivore reachable sustainable and enjoyable for the masses so where you want to eat bread or you want to eat cake you can take my recipes and you can add sugar and sugar is the one sweetener that I will emphatically encourage everyone to use over any other sweeteners. Um, and I know there's going to be a lots of shocks and oh, what is she saying? Um, and there's many reasons behind that. But um, over my eight years experience, knowing what I know, I would emphatically please use sugar, but you can add sugar and your sweeteners of choice to my recipes to make them sweet for yourself and make them palatable. I do that for my family. I do that for my friends. And what I have started doing is the first time I make it for them, I will reduce the sugar amount that they would normally find in a recipe. So if something calls for a cup, I'm gonna put in two, um, three fourths of a cup of sugar. And I get their reaction to that and see what they see what they say, get their feedback. If they say it was great and they loved it, perfect. Because the next time I'm putting two thirds cup sugar in there mm -hmm. and I see what they say. And if they don't say anything, the next time I'm putting a half a cup of sugar in there, the next time I'm going. So the minute that they say, sneeze a little bit of sugar, I'll go back and go ahead and to the other added dose, whatever. So with the mindset, obviously they're not going to be switching to, to know, they're not switching to carnivore. They don't want to. But if you are looking to do that, looking to switch your family to that, your children to that, then just keep reducing that sugar added sweetener over time. If that takes two years, if that takes three years, if that takes six months, that's better than where you were, right? right. And I have donuts. I've got milkshakes. I've got 
I mean, my literal mission is carnivore junk foods, but I've moved it to say Terry's carnivore treats. So it doesn't look so negative, but that's really my mission. My slogan, not in the mood to eat meat, turn to Terry's carnivore treats. There you have it. So not everything has to be meat focused. My, my foods are, they contain whey protein powders and these protein powders so that you do have protein that you are eating. You can, you know, meet your leucine threshold so that it is not just empty junk that you're eating. There's actual real nutritional value in it, even though it looks like junk. That's awesome. That, that's I love it. so helpful to have that. And for people to be able to kind of slowly transition if, if the thought of just cutting everything out and going straight carnivore, which some people do, and mm -hmm. that works well for them. And that is great, but other people, yeah. you know, really struggle and then they fall off and they try again yes. and then they fall off. And so they need that kind of gradual titration, you know, to absolutely full on carnivore. And then that yes. makes it st sustainable for them. So I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. That's how, I mean, that's how we get the migrainers on board. You know, it's like, you know, like, Oh, I don't know about that. What about bread? What about this? And I say, Hey, so take this bread, make yourself a sandwich and have a carnivore milkshake with it. And there you go. You know, easy peasy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> I think that wraps it up for us for today. So again, thank you so much for being here. And we're going to list your YouTube channel, your uh, Instagram, and we'll put Dr. Stanton's um, website or Facebook group in there also. And okay, great. People can, can check all of that out and get Thank you help. so much. And, and we, there are, there, we have many people that join that do not have migraines. So we run really the, the literal gamut of metabolic health issues. So like, if you have any sort of anything and you're wanting to learn how to do this, we absolutely take non-migrainers as well. So anybody's welcome to join and learn, and we'd love to have you. And, and thank you ladies so much for letting me share my story. And I appreciate it so much. Thank, Thank you, Terry. It was such a pleasure. We'll, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Okay, take care. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.